A dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road. A long, agonized wailing, as if from fear. The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another, and another, till, borne on the wind which now sighed softly through the pass, a wild howling began, which seemed to come from all over the country as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night. A shimmering moon and a chill wind through a darkened landscape. These words could only come from one novel. The great horror classic, Dracula. Penned by the Irish-born writer Bram Stoker. The name Dracula strikes fear whenever it's mentioned. Such is the power of this novel about a monstrous vampire that feeds on human blood. The character of Count Dracula himself has become as legendary as the hideous Frankenstein's monster in the history of horror. While the story of Dracula has been used time and again in films, dating back to the early 20th century and the silent movies, right up to the present day and the post-millennium Hollywood blockbuster. But what of the author of this gruesome novel of bloodlust? Who created this tale of the living dead, sucking every last drop of blood from their unsuspecting victims? In precisely the same way that Mary Shelley is little recognized for Frankenstein, the novel she created when she was a mere 18 years old, the author of Dracula, Bram Stoker, is a similarly overlooked figure in the world of literature. Abraham Stoker, shortened to Bram when he was a child, was born on the outskirts of Ireland's capital city, Dublin, in 1847. As a young man, his early life was spent in Dublin, where he worked as a civil servant, a career that was stable, if uninspiring. But in later years, he moved to England, preferring to risk all for the world of the theater, becoming the manager of the renowned and flamboyant actor Henry Irving, based at the magnificent Lyceum Theater in London. The two halves of Bram Stoker's life could not have been more contrasting. And as we set out on this journey of discovery to find both Dracula and his creator, it's immediately evident that our road will take us in a number of different directions. The novel Dracula, first published in 1897, after seven years of research and writing, was launched as Great Britain neared the end of a century that had exhibited more technological, scientific, literary, and medical advancement than ever before. Queen Victoria's long reign was drawing to a close, but the respectability she had imposed on British life still dominated. However, despite being a time of strict morals on the surface, Victorian Britain certainly possessed its darker side. On the one side, highborn ladies and gentlemen sip tea in elegant drawing rooms while on London's mean streets, prostitution was rife, 
Opium dens and gin palaces were to be found if you knew where to look. And this was far from being the age of innocence. As the father of modern psychology, Sigmund Freud, would prove, sexual repression was bad for the health. And just because manners and etiquette prevented passion being expressed, it didn't mean that the late Victorians lacked desire. In fact, in Dracula, Bram Stoker truly is using a sexual metaphor, as his delicate heroines offer a naked neck to the blood-sucking fiend at a time of buttoned-up-to-the-chin respectability. Now, whether or not this was Bram Stoker's intention, we can't say, because as a respectable Victorian, he actually wrote articles about the need to censor unwholesome literature. His Dracula is, in point of fact, a very moral tale, featuring the age-old theme of good triumphing over evil and the ultimate in spiritual redemption. However, more often than not, it's the sensuality that his audiences remember, such as this incident where three female vampires encounter the shocked hero of the novel, Jonathan Harker. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The fair girl went on her knees and bent over me, fairly gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness that was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal, till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white, sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head, as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed to fasten on my throat. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. After hearing that emotive piece of literature, we could be forgiven for thinking that Bram Stoker was born in some great Gothic castle in Transylvania, just like the one Count Dracula lived in. But Stoker's birthplace actually takes us to Ireland. Just north of Dublin, in Clontarf, an elegant suburb, Abraham Stoker made his first appearance in the world. This is where the Battle of Clontarf took place in 1014, when Viking invaders were defeated, marking the end of a long-fought war between the Irish and the Vikings. Even today, there is much evidence of Ireland's Viking heritage and the magnificent Dublin Castle that stands so beautifully and majestically on the highest ground in the city was built on the remains of a Viking fortress that had been destroyed during the last battle. The castle dates from 1208 and is the oldest surviving architecture in Dublin. Used as the center of British power in Ireland for over seven centuries, it was reclaimed by the Irish Free State in 1922, when the Republic of Ireland gained independence from British rule. It's now used for government ceremonial functions, such as the inauguration of Ireland's presidents. But we will return to the castle a little later. Now, although Bram Stoker is one of the least instantly recognizable Dublin authors, he certainly was part of an illustrious company of writers who heralded from this fair city. This was the birthplace of Oscar Wilde, acclaimed novelist and playwright, whose works include The Importance of Being Earnest and The Picture of Dorian Gray, 
as well as James Joyce, the writer of the controversial novel Ulysses, alongside Samuel Beckett, the surreal genius of such theatrical pieces as Waiting for Godot and Endgame, right up to the present day with the brilliant Roddy Doyle, the celebrated writer of The Commitments. Bram Stoker wasn't the healthiest of infants, as he spent most of his early life in bed due to a mystery illness that robbed him of energy and offered up a huge range of confusing symptoms, stopping him from being able to stand or walk unaided and also creating untold havoc with his sleep patterns. Yet, this bizarre sickness vanished without a trace when Bram Stoker was seven years old. Although the mental scars it left on the small boy took much longer to heal. The legacy of such a trauma for a young child remained with him for life and undoubtedly resurfaced in Dracula, where the idea of everlasting sleep and resurrection from the dead certainly prevail. As a result of this early incapacitation, Bram Stoker was educated from his bedroom thanks to his love of reading. This was something he had in common with the celebrated novelist H.G. Wells, author of the seminal science fiction novel The War of the Worlds. He too was confined to bed as a child, and as a result read as many books as he could prevail upon his family to bring him. Bram Stoker also shares his Irish heritage, albeit southern rather than northern, with the famous novelist C.S. Lewis, author of the many books that make up the Chronicles of Narnia. Like C.S. Lewis, Bram Stoker was captivated by the beautiful countryside of Ireland, with the lush green rolling hills and valleys filtering through into both authors' later works. In the case of C.S. Lewis, the landscape of his fictional country, Narnia, was taken from the real landscape of Ireland, and he celebrated it, remembering summer days and happy times playing in a place of joy and exploration. However, that's where the similarity ends, as Bram Stoker perceived an image the exact opposite of the rural idol immortalized by C.S. Lewis. Whenever he was taken out of his house for brief trips while he was so unwell, he saw the countryside as cold and frightening, stretching out in front of him for miles with seemingly no end or beginning he would use his memories of this vast expanse of land with the empty nature of the area and inclement weather as a basis for his writings. Many of his stories and none more so than Dracula describe places that are empty and barren and truly terrifying, just like his portrayal of Transylvania would prove to be. In a busy household that included six children, Bram Stoker was often ignored and overlooked because of his continual bed rest and illness, only venturing out for prescribed trips to the countryside to get fresh air and for services at nearby St. Michael's Church with the family. Bram Stoker's recovery was considered nothing short of a miracle by his doctors, confirmed in later years when he went on to become the most successful of all of his siblings, evidently making up for lost time. In fact, he excelled in the very thing he was robbed of when younger, namely physical exercise and sport. In 1864, he began attending Trinity College in Dublin, studying history, 
literature, mathematics, and physics, and he became a celebrated all-round athlete and star football player. Trinity College, founded in 1592, is part of the University of Dublin and has a rather old-fashioned but refreshingly accurate name, the College of the Holy and Undivided Trinity of Queen Elizabeth near Dublin. This magnificent educational edifice is situated on College Green and stands opposite the imposing architecture of the former Irish Houses of Parliament. and Bram Stoker excelled in his studies, leaving Trinity College with honors in all of the subjects he had taken. Under pressure from his father, he took up employment as a civil servant, working for the government in Dublin Castle, as soon as his studies were at an end. However, he soon found he missed university life, especially as his job was so dull and uninteresting. He kept up his association with the college via debating societies and also completing further education courses, studying part-time for a higher degree in mathematics. It was through these debating societies that he became friendly with Oscar Wilde when Oscar took up his studies there in 1871. But their friendship was to falter when Bram Stoker stole the heart of Oscar Wilde's girlfriend, Florence Balcom. It has even been suggested that the reason Oscar Wilde left Ireland was as a direct result of his heartache over Florence marrying Bram Stoker in 1878. Yet, with the benefit of hindsight and Oscar's predilection for his own sex, this does seem rather unlikely. As a matter of interest, one of the most celebrated of all Dracula films was nearly lost for all time because of Florence Balcom. A 1922 silent film called Nosferatu, made by a German production company, used Bram Stoker's Dracula as its subject without official permission from the Bram Stoker estate. At the time, Bram Stoker had only been dead for 10 years and the novel was still in copyright. Florence sued for copyright infringement and won the case, bankrupting the company. Luckily, some prints had already been distributed overseas, which were then copied over the years, resulting in Nosferatu gaining a reputation as possibly the greatest adaptation of the vampire legend. Bram Stoker, continually dissatisfied with his job as a civil servant, began to write for the Dublin Evening Mail newspaper as an unpaid drama critic, reviewing as many shows as he could get to see, having already developed a great love of theater. There was one actor with whom Bram Stoker was fascinated, called Sir Henry Irving, a charismatic, larger-than-life man who exuded the same fascinating presence offstage as he did when playing a role on it. Sir Henry Irving was the very first actor to be given a knighthood and is generally regarded as being the greatest stage actor ever, even though there are counter arguments that suggest he was the worst stage actor of all time. Nevertheless, he is buried in London's magnificent Westminster Abbey and is one of only four actors to be buried there, the others being David Garrick, Dame Sybil Thorndike, and Sir Laurence Olivier. In 1871, Bram Stoker saw Irving play Hamlet and was surprised that no critic had reviewed the performance, so he took it upon himself to do so. In 1876, when visiting Dublin, Irving was shown the review that Bram Stoker had penned some years earlier, 
and was so impressed by it that he asked to meet the young critic. They became close friends and developed a real love-hate relationship, almost to the point where they couldn't stand to be in each other's company, but couldn't cope with being apart. One critic described it as, a kind of incestuous, necrophiliac, oral sadistic, all-in-all -all wrestling match. Sir Henry Irving came to stay in Dublin with Bram Stoker a number of times in the next few years. In 1878, Irving asked Bram Stoker to be his manager, which was an opportunity not to be missed. So the bored civil servant left bureaucracy and Ireland behind him for a new life in England with his wife Florence. The following year, Bram and Florence had their one and only child, a son, christened Noel. Florence often expressed concern over Sir Henry Irving's hold over her husband, commenting that it was as if Bram was hypnotized and under a cursed spell. She didn't disapprove of the friendship or dislike Irving, but she would later mention that she was troubled by the destructive nature of the love-hate relationship the two men shared. This view completely contrasts with the two volumes of memoirs that Bram Stoker published in 1906, a year after Irving's sudden death at the age of 67. Entitled The Personal Reminiscences of Henry Irving, Stoker extolled every virtue but none of the vices the actor possessed, but in an entertaining and amusing fashion. The volumes are a wonderful archive of the time Stoker and Irving shared together, as well as providing a detailed record of performances and tours they embarked upon while working together as manager and actor. Now, in the same year that Sir Henry Irving asked Bram Stoker to become his personal manager, he also leased the Lyceum Theatre in London and appointed Bram Stoker as theatre manager. The Lyceum Theatre is stunningly beautiful, looking like a piece of classical ancient Greek architecture with its formidable facade and portico. But its good looks were not its only claim to fame. The Lyceum Theatre became the cultural capital of the City of London, and it was the most fashionable place to be seen. It was truly a phenomenon. Irving combined powerful Victorian melodramas, which tugged at the audience's heartstrings, with lavish productions of the plays of William Shakespeare, such as Much Ado About Nothing, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, Twelfth Night, and The Merchant of Venice. Because of this amazing success, Bram Stoker was caught up in the whirlwind of celebrity life, meeting many people that would become his friends like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, writer of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, and Charles Dickens, author of such classics as Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, Bleak House, and Great Expectations. Sir Henry Irving also organized trips overseas to America where they met the great American writer and thinker, Mark Twain. Fascinating as the world of Victorian theater might be, we do find ourselves asking a very important question. Where did Dracula come from? How on earth did Bram Stoker, this respectable, married, middle-class gentleman, who was occupied with managing the greatest actor of his generation, find the inspiration or the time to write one of the greatest horror novels of all time. Bram Stoker lived in an age where everything seemed to be happening all at once. Queen Victoria certainly dominated, but it was an amazing era of change, which affected everyone from the highest in the land to the lowliest.
Charles Darwin wrote and published his thought-provoking The Origin of the Species in 1859, challenging religion by arguing that the human race evolved from the apes via a process of natural selection. In other words, creating the survival of the fittest theory. The Industrial Revolution brought about a wealthier economy with Britain becoming dependent upon factories and mass production rather than agriculture for survival. It was also the age of the great engineers as typified by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who created the Great Western Railway. The transatlantic steamship the SS Great Britain and the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol that hangs above the River Avon in the southwest of England, and at the time of conception in 1862, had the longest span of any bridge in the world. The Fabian Society was set up in London by a group of intellectuals to promote socialism, a concept whereby everyone is equal in terms of wealth and in society with H.G. Wells, the author of The War of the Worlds, being a prominent and outspoken member for a time. The Great Exhibition of 1851, the first World Trade Fair, was held in the Crystal Palace, Hyde Park, London, with great success, showcasing as it did the modern industrial technology and design of the Victorian age. The Crystal Palace was built specifically to house the exhibition, with Isambard Kingdom Brunel drafted onto the committee to oversee design and production. But the construction was sadly destroyed by fire in 1936. In 1882, incandescent electric lights were introduced to London streets to replace the gas lamps that had to be manually lit every night and extinguished every morning. And it was against this progressive background that the Gothic novel really rose to prominence. And Bram Stoker evidently found this genre a source of inspiration. Looking back, it all began with the likes of Horace Walpole and his Castle of Otranto, and Mrs. Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho. Even the genteel Jane Austen tried her hand at all things Gothic in Northanger Abbey, and Emily Bronte, a quiet vicar's daughter, shocked the world with her terrifying anti-hero Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights. These novels were the first of their kind to introduce a frightening effect on the reader, rather than making them feel comfortable and part of the story. The Gothic novel was the direct predecessor of modern horror fiction, which is thriving to this very day. The first vampire story that really caught the imagination was written at exactly the same time as Mary Shelley was creating Frankenstein, and Bram Stoker elaborated upon this tale to create his own vampire legend. It was simply called The Vampire, but spelt with a Y rather than an I, and it was written by John William Polidori, a personal physician to the eminent poet and writer Lord Byron and was published in 1819. In fact, The Vampire and Frankenstein came out of a mutual experience. When Mary Shelley was staying with her poet husband Percy Bishy Shelley at Lord Byron's villa by Lake Geneva in Switzerland, the weather was so appalling that they all stayed indoors. They read ghost stories to each other, and then Byron challenged Percy and Mary, as well as his doctor, to write their own ghost story. Thank you. 
Mary Shelley won hands down with Frankenstein, but The Vampire by John Polidori certainly had its merits. In the same way that Bram Stoker would base his vampire, Count Dracula, on the man he was most in awe of, the famous actor Sir Henry Irving, the same could be said of John Polidori, who used the mad, bad, and dangerous to know Lord Byron as the basis for his vampire. In fact, John Polidori was the man who transformed the gritty folklore tales of vampires into something universally recognizable today, namely that of an aristocratic fiend who preys upon women in high society. Bram Stoker elaborated on that theme with his Count Dracula, a very aristocratic gentleman living in his own castle who preys on the innocent women of Victorian society when he is let loose in England. Of course, there was an even bigger influence on Bram Stoker when he began writing Dracula, and that was the mysterious case of Jack the Ripper. The British press dubbed this unknown murderer Jack the Ripper after a letter from Jack claimed responsibility for the gruesome killings. In the late summer and into the autumn of 1888, Jack the Ripper preyed on prostitutes and destitute women in the poverty-stricken Whitechapel area of London. This was a national and international sensation at the time with the police unable to catch the killer sometimes missing him by a matter of minutes. He is thought to have murdered five women, but there may well have been more. Each of the victims had their throat cut, and their bodies were horrifically mutilated with surgical precision. Theorists believe that the killer may have been a skilled medical surgeon, and even Queen Victoria's own physician, Sir William Gull, was counted as a suspect. The fact that the true identity of Jack the Ripper was never discovered gave him an air of mystery, danger, and intrigue. The public, although frightened, genuinely seemed to thirst for more news of him. When he vanished completely some months later, the public demanded to know more, their desire for a good horror story coming to the fore. Bram Stoker used elements of Jack the Ripper in his depiction of Count Dracula creating a mythical, dangerous, but alluring individual who nobody can actually identify. However, without a doubt, the main point of research for Bram Stoker's Dracula is generally accepted to be from Eastern European history, where the folklore tales of vampires originated. Vlad the Impaler, a 15th century nobleman, seems to fit the description of the Count perfectly. He was a prince, he was legendary for his cruelty, became famous for impaling his victims during execution, and was a demon in battles against his enemies. Even after his death, stories circulated that he was alive and was impossible to kill. And now it's time for the Bram Stoker story of Dracula itself. Everyone always assumes that they know what happens in this novel because of the many, many movies that have been made featuring Count Dracula. But few of these cinematic offerings have followed the book's plot very faithfully. The only movie that did was Francis Ford Coppola's 1992 version, which was commercially but not critically successful. Oddly, this draws a similar parallel with Stoker's book, 
which was never a classic in any shape or form, but it sold extremely well, despite what the literary critics had to say about it. Ironically, though, it's been the movie versions that have kept people interested in the book, allowing Bram Stoker's story and characters to live long past their sell-by date. The same is true of the 1994 production of Frankenstein. Mary Shelley, like Bram Stoker, was largely a forgotten author, with a book that was an instant success with the reading public, but disliked by the critics. Interestingly, both these late 20th century film versions are proud to acknowledge the author's names before the titles, making them Bram Stoker's Dracula and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein which shows how closely they were trying to follow the author's original content. Bram Stoker's Dracula is what's known as an epistolary novel, in that it discards one clear narrative voice to tell the story, replacing it with letters to and from the cast of characters, diary entries, newspaper clippings, and various documents and journals. The word epistolary comes from the Greek word for letters, which is epistle. This particular writing device, so literary historians say, had gone out of fashion in the decades before Queen Victoria came to the British throne. And it's interesting to note that Jane Austen had written her world-famous novel Sense and Sensibility in this very way in its first draft before deciding to rewrite it in the more popular narrative form. Therefore, Bram Stoker can actually take credit for resurrecting this outdated way of writing to great effect. Dracula begins with the journal entries of a young solicitor called Jonathan Harker, who is on his way to see the reclusive and mysterious Count Dracula in Transylvania and tell him about the new property he's acquired in London, England. Upon arrival, Jonathan Harker is taken prisoner and witnesses a whole host of strange, unusual, and mysterious things in Count Dracula's castle. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and there shall be to you many strange things. Parker finally manages to escape and return to England in a frenzied state of shock and fear. He convinces himself that everything he saw was simply a case of temporary madness brought on by his dark surroundings. In England, Jonathan's fiancée, Wilhelmina Murray, known as Mina, visits her best friend, Lucy Westenra, concerned about the missing Harker. Lucy, a frivolous and flirtatious girl, has just had three marriage proposals from Dr. John Stewart, an American called Quincy Morris, and the Honorable Arthur Holmwood, known as Lord Godalming after the death of his father. Lucy chooses Arthur as her husband, and Mina is reunited with Jonathan Harker when he sails back into England and they are married. How blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Count Dracula decides to follow Harker back to England to find fresh blood and arrives on a ship in the port of Whidbey in North Yorkshire where Mina and Lucy are staying. The ship carrying Count Dracula is run aground in a storm and wrecked 
with only the logbook recovered. A newspaper cutting concerning a deadly killer, dressed entirely in black, is discovered within the logbook. It is, of course, none other than Count Dracula, and in the shape of a wolf, he moves between Whitby in the north to London in the southeast. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. Mina witnesses Lucy walking in her sleep, leaving the house and returning with blood on her nightdress. She has become the first victim of Count Dracula. Dr. Seward is called to treat her. As he does so, he recounts the tale of a man in his insane asylum in London called Renfield. The poor, unfortunate Renfield is being slowly turned into a vampire by nightly visits from Count Dracula and is his servant, but Dr. Seward doesn't realize this. In the end, the good doctor calls in his friend and mentor, Professor Abraham Van Helsing, to help him find out what is ailing Lucy and to examine Renfield. Van Helsing meets with Mina first, who shows him Jonathan's journals of his time in Transylvania. Finding two scars on Lucy's neck, diagnosing extreme blood loss, but without hemorrhaging, and listening to the story of Renfield, Van Helsing realizes what the danger is. There are mysteries which men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. Van Helsing brings together Mina and Jonathan Harker, along with Lucy's fiance, Arthur Holmwood, and her two other suitors, Dr. Seward and Quincy Morris. He tells them that he has heard of Count Dracula and explains that vampires are a reality, that they are the undead that exist after the original human has died by feeding on the warm blood of the living. He also explains that the symptoms displayed by Lucy are that of someone being turned into a vampire. There are such things as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience, the teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane peoples. In order to reverse the process, Van Helsing, Arthur, Quincy and Dr. Seward all give their blood in separate transfusions, but Lucy eventually dies. Of course, the conversion is then complete, and she reappears as a vampire version of herself. <coughs> After Van Helsing explains again that Lucy is no longer who she was when she was alive, his determined group go to find her and kill her. Lucy's distraught but stoic fiance, Arthur Holmwood, has to perform the deed, driving a stake into her sleeping form. Lucy's head is then cut off and garlic is stuffed into her mouth. The sweetness was turned to adamantine heartless cruelty and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. They then educate themselves with the teachings of Professor Van Helsing of the strengths and weaknesses of the vampire race. A game of cat and mouse ensues where the hunters become the hunted and vice versa. While they are overturning the Count's many lairs in London, thereby weakening him by cutting off his supply of blood, Dracula attacks Mina and attempts to convert her into a vampire. Renfield escapes the mental asylum and unwittingly leads them to Count Dracula. In the end, Renfield, who begs to be released from the curse of the vampire, 
sacrifices himself in order to help Mina. You are but mortal woman. Time is now to be dreaded, since once he put that mark upon your throat. In an effort to save Mina, they have to kill Dracula as quickly as they can, and they manage to drive him out of England. The chase ends in Transylvania, where they intercept him before he reaches his castle. Traveling in a box filled with Transylvanian earth and protected by a band of gypsies, the final climactic battle sees Quincy Morris die of fatal wounds, Jonathan kill the Count by stabbing him through the heart, and Mina being released from the curse. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it shear through the throat, while at the same moment, Mr. Morris's Bowie knife plunged in the heart. On their return to England, the Harkers, Dr. Seward, and Professor Van Helsing remain lifelong friends, but burn their journals of the experience and never speak of it again, for fear that people might think them insane. Seven years after the death of Count Dracula, Jonathan and Mina have a baby boy who is born on the very same day that Quincy Morris died, and they name him after their American friend. We are all drifting reefwards now, and faith is our only anchor. In writing Dracula, it is said that real people inspired the major characters. The Count himself, as we already know, was based on Sir Henry Irving, the celebrated actor. Professor Abraham Van Helsing, repository of worldly wisdom, doctor, barrister, and psychic detective, was appropriately named after the author, as well as being something of a character sketch of his great friend Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, writer of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Jonathan Harker was Bram Stoker's alter ego, the passionless solicitor who heroically achieves manhood when he finally kills Count Dracula which is very much like Stoker himself, breaking free from the convention of being a civil servant. Mina Murray, married to Jonathan during the course of the novel, was the epitome of Stoker's own mother, who was always brave and loyal. The frivolous and fragile Lucy, yearning to marry all her suitors and opposing repressive Victorian society, echoes Bram Stoker's socially ambitious wife, Florence. The character of Renfield, the struggling lunatic who is Dracula's servant, but in a very unwilling way, echoes Bram Stoker's own life, as he felt that he was forever under the spell of Sir Henry Irving, who he worked for and idolized, but constantly wanted to break away from. The locations of the novel are also interesting, taken from Bram Stoker's life, with Transylvania's open expanses and stormy weather, reflecting his memories of his younger days when he lived in Ireland. And of course, it was his own visits to Whitby that literally inspired much of the novel. While his London experiences with Sir Henry Irving would have definitely ensured he knew the dark underbelly of the city, as well as the great public buildings. Unlike London, where many novels and films have been set, the little town of Whitby in North Yorkshire was pretty unique in Dracula's literary history. Whitby has embraced the connection with Dracula, with the result that many thousands of tourists interested in the mighty vampire visit here every year. But what of this small town in North Yorkshire, on the northeast coast of Great Britain? What made it so irresistible to Bram Stoker? 
The port of Whitby is one of the main European ports because of its close proximity to the Scandinavian countries, which is why it's used for Dracula's arrival in the novel, with vessels of up to 3,000 tons docking and departing every day. The Dracula Museum in Whitby is a major tourist attraction because of the large section of the novel that's set in this town, describing as it does the port, the ship washed ashore in the harbor, and Lucy watching the sunset from Whitby's churchyard over the nearby headland of Cattleness. 20 Twice every year, the town of Whitby holds a Gothic weekend which is a festival for people who enjoy all things Gothic. And Whitby's hotels will get booked up six months in advance for these events. However, the most striking landmark in Whitby is the ruined monastery situated on the East Cliff. Whitby Abbey was founded in the 7th century on the cliffs overlooking what can, on occasion, be a very wild sea. Wherever you view the ruins from, it is indeed a dramatic vista, and one that will forever be linked to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Nevertheless, Whitby does have another claim to fame due to its associations with the great seafarer Captain James Cook. It seems a long way from blustery, windswept Whitby to the warmer climes of Australia, but by all accounts, Whitby always held a special place in Captain Cook's heart. Despite enjoying the sea air at Whitby, Bram Stoker did not outlive his friend and mentor, Sir Henry Irving, by many years, as he died in 1912. The exact cause of death is unknown, but some suspect it may have been syphilis. When Irving died in 1905, Stoker was so distraught he suffered a stroke himself that incapacitated him greatly. And although he was by then free of Irving's shadow, he was too unwell to write anything that would capitalize on the success of Dracula. He and Florence lived a hand-to-mouth existence during the last few years of his life, relying on financial assistance from friends and relations. Bram Stoker was cremated perhaps fearful of his own creation's ability to raise the dead and feed on human blood, or maybe simply to prevent anyone discovering the real reason for his death at a later date. His ashes can be found at Golders Green Cemetery, London, where the more die-hard Dracula enthusiasts will search out his final resting place. But his creation still walks among us, unable to allow death to stop his evil march. The legacy of his most famous novel, Dracula, and the eponymous character of the gentleman count will live forever.
This deliciously evil monster can be both deadly dangerous and yet devastatingly attractive all in one breath, always appealing and constantly revolting by equal measure. This may indeed be the true magic of Dracula. So we'll give the Count the last word on the subject and wonder if, in our imaginations at least, he'll return from the dead once more. My revenge has just begun. I spread it over centuries and time is on my side.